In this video, we are going to focus on how to quickly tell if a compound or molecule is polar or nonpolar. So let's begin. Let's start with diatomic molecules. Diatomic molecules like hydrogen, um, oxygen, which looks like this, nitrogen gas, So like O2, N2, um, Cl2, Br2, F2. All of these diatomic molecules are nonpolar. Now the reason why they're nonpolar is because they share electrons equally. Whenever you have equal sharing of electrons, it's nonpolar. It's electrically neutral overall. There's no in a polar molecule, one side is partially positive, the other side is partially negative. But just know this, all diatomic molecules, so H2O2, N2, F2, Cl2, Br2, I2, all of these are nonpolar. Now let's say if we have a binary molecule that is different. Let's say like HF, hydrofluoric acid. Here it's diatomic, but it contains different elements and this molecule is polar. The reason for that is because the electrons um, in this molecule are shared unequally. Fluorine is more electronegative than hydrogen so because fluorine pulls the electrons toward itself it's going to acquire a partial negative charge and so hydrogen is going to acquire a partial positive charge because it loses electron density and so you have a polar molecule. If you were to draw the, the shape of this molecule, it would look something like this. The fluorine atom will have a negative partial charge, and hydrogen will be partially positive. So diatomic molecules that usually contain different elements, like HF, HBr, HCl, these are polar molecules. Whenever you have a separation of charge, where one side is positive and the other side is negative, you have a polarized object. So now let's look at some other examples. Hydrocarbons like methane, CH4, ethane, C2H6, even ethene, which is C2H4, acetylene, C2H2. All of these molecules, they're all nonpolar. Anytime you have a compound that contains only carbon hydrogen bonds they're all nonpolar if you look at the carbon hydrogen bond carbon has an electronegativity value of 2.5 and for hydrogen it's about 2.1 so whenever the en difference is less than 0.5 the bond is considered to be nonpolar but nevertheless you do have a small dipole moment which points towards the more electronegative carbon atom but these dipole moments they cancel out if we were to draw the arrows for acetylene, notice that they point in opposite directions, they cancel. And even for um, ethene, C2H4, they cancel as well. And if we draw the Lewis structure for methane, notice that all of the dipole moments cancel. They all point towards the more electronegative carbon center. Now the next scenario, is whenever you have a molecule that contains the same outer elements. So like SiBr4. If we were to draw the Lewis structure for that compound, it would look something like this. We have a silicon atom at the center surrounded by four identical bromine atoms. Now bromine is more electronegative than silicon, so it's going to pull the electrons toward itself. Notice that all of the dipole moments cancel. So other compounds in this category that have the same tetrahedral Lewis structure, CCL4, CF4, GEH4, they all have that tetrahedral molecular geometry and all of the outer elements are identical. So therefore, all of these molecules are nonpolar. Let's look at another similar uh, scenario, but with a different geometry. For example, like PCL5. 
it has a Lewis structure that looks like this. There's no lone pairs on the center phosphorus atom. And all of the dipole moments, which points towards the more electronegative chlorine atom, they all point opposite directions. So therefore, this molecule as well is nonpolar. And any other molecule in this category. So like other elements that are in the same column as phosphorus in the periodic table, like arsenic, ASF5, or PF5, or PBR5, or SBCL5. All of these, they have the same geometry. And because all of the outer elements are identical, these types of molecules are nonpolar. Now let's look at compounds that have a linear geometry, like CO2 or CS2. When you draw the Lewis structure for CO2, carbon dioxide, it looks like this. The dipole moments cancel. And so this molecule is nonpolar. Carbon disulfide also has a similar geometry. However, the carbon sulfur bond is not polar. The electronegativity difference between carbon and sulfur are about the same, 2.5. So even if there was a dipole moment, it would still cancel, but there isn't. So this molecule is definitely nonpolar. Some other examples of linear molecules include like BEH2, which looks like this. You can see this is nonpolar. BECL2, BEF2, they all have the same linear structure, so those molecules are nonpolar as well. Now, molecules that have a trigonal planar structure, like BH3, these molecules are nonpolar as well. There's no lone pairs on the center atom. So other compounds in this category would be like aluminum chloride. Notice that boron and aluminum are in the same column of the periodic table. ALBR3, it can be paired up with a different halogen like ALF3 or even FEBR3. As an individual unit, these uh, compounds are nonpolar. Now the next category includes the octahedral molecular geometry like SEF6. If we were to draw the Lewis structure for that molecule, it will look like this. All of the outer elements are identical, and so all of the dipole moments uh, cancel. So therefore, this molecule is also nonpolar. So other molecules in this category, like SBR6, SF6, SECL6, sulfur and selenium are in the same column of the periodic table, so therefore they have a similar molecular geometry. Fluorine, bromine, chlorine, they're in the same column of the periodic table as well. They're part of the halogen family. So SI6, SEI6, all of these will have the same octahedral shape and therefore would be considered nonpolar. Now let's look at molecules that have a polar geometry. For example, like water. Water has a bent shape. And because of that, the dipole moments do not cancel. Oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen, and so the arrows, they point towards oxygen. So other elements that are similar to oxygen, like sulfur and selenium, so like H2S will have the same structure and would therefore be considered to be a relatively polar molecule. SF2 also has a similar structure. Both fluorine and hydrogen like to form one bond. So therefore, their structure will be similar. SCL2, SEBR2, all of these have a bent molecular geometry. And the fact that we have lone pairs also contributes to its polarity. So all of these molecules are considered to be polar. They all have a net dipole moment. The next molecular geometry that is usually polar are those that have, like NH3. It has a trigonal planar, not a planar, but a trigonal pyramidal molecular geometry. NH3 looks like this. It has one lone pair, and nitrogen is more electronegative than hydrogen. Notice that the dipole moments, they don't cancel out. They point generally in this upward direction. So other elements, or other molecules like PH3, um, that has one lone pair. Phosphorus and nitrogen are very similar. They're in the same category, in the same column of the periodic table. So like ASH3, let's see, 
PBR3, PCL3, and F3, these molecules are relatively polar. By the way, SO2 and SEO2, they have a similar bent shape like water. But they only have one lump here instead of two, though. These molecules are also polar, like water, because of their bent shape. Now, oxygen is more electronegative than sulfur, so the arrows point away towards sulfur, but they don't completely cancel because they point away at an angle. So molecules like IF3, ClF3, BRF3, or like ICL3, or like BRCL3. All of these have the same shape and are all polar. Iodine trifluoride um, has a Lewis structure that looks like this. It's basically a T-shaped molecular geometry. And notice that these bonds, th those dipole moments, they cancel, but nothing cancels with this one. Plus the fact that you have two lone pairs on top. Um, make these types of molecules polar. So if you have the T-shaped molecular geometry, for the most part, it's going to be polar. Now molecules such as like IF5, CLF5, BRF5, ICL5, or like BRCL5, these are polar as well. So their structure looks like this. Let's draw IF5. IF5 contains 42 electrons. And so each fluorine atom wants to have 8 electrons. So 8 times 5 is 40. And that means that iodine has two lone pairs. So it adds up to a total of 42 valence electrons. Now notice that the four fluorine atoms at the center, they all cancel. But the fifth fluorine atom, it doesn't cancel with anything. So therefore, this molecule is polar. Plus the presence of this lone pair also makes it polar as well. Now the last category we're going to consider are the uh, these molecules like SF4, SeCl4, SBr4, and SeI4. Now keep in mind it's different from like CBr4, like CCl4 or CH4 or SiH4. These molecules on this side are polar whereas these are nonpolar. Carbon has four valence electrons. Carbon, silicon, germanium, sulfur, selenium, they have six valence electrons. And so because sulfur has two more valence electrons than carbon, its Lewis structure is going to be different. Instead of having a tetrahedral shape, it's going to have an extra lone pair, which causes it to have a seesaw, like a seesaw shape. So these dipole moments, they cancel. However, the dipole moments in blue, they don't, making this molecule polar. Now, if we draw the Lewis structure for like CBr4, it doesn't have those extra two electrons. If you count the valence electrons, you're going to get a total of 32. Here, it's 34. And because 32 is a multiple of 8, that means there's no lone pairs on the central carbon atom. So therefore, all of the dipole moments in CBr4 and other compounds that are similar to it, they're all nonpolar because they cancel out. So hopefully this video gave you some more insight on how you can quickly tell if a molecule is polar or not. But now the last category we're going to go over is whenever you have a molecule in a molecule that contains different outer elements. So for example, like CH3F. Here we have a carbon that has three hydrogens and a fluorine atom. In a situation like this, the best way to analyze it is, sim is to simply draw the dipole moments and take into account the, the dipole of the bonds. So let's analyze CH3F. The carbon-hydrogen bond is relatively nonpolar. We talked about this earlier. The EN difference is less than 0.5. However, the carbon-fluorine bond is polar. Fluorine has an electronegativity value of 4.0, so the EN difference is much greater than 0.5.
So we're going to draw the dipole moments according to the relative size. Here the difference is about 0.4. Here the difference is about 1.5. So the carbon fluorine bond should have a dipole moment that's about maybe three to four times larger than the dipole moment for the carbon hydrogen bond. So I'm going to draw this arrow very big. Now, carbon is more electronegative than hydrogen, so the arrow points towards carbon. But we're going to draw smaller arrows. So it appears as if these dipole moments, they sort of cancel each other out. But these two, they add. So whenever the molecule has a net dipole moment, it's polar. And this is what you have to do whenever the outer elements are not identical, whenever they're different. The only way to analyze it is to draw the Lewis structure, analyze the bonds, and then draw the dipole moments according to the relative size. So let's look at another example, CSO. This is the Lewis structure for CSO. It looks like carbon dioxide and carbon disulfide. Carbon dioxide looks like this. We know the dipole moments cancel out because the outer elements are identical. But when they're different, it's a whole new story. So if we analyze the carbon-oxygen bond, carbon has an EN value of 2.5, and for oxygen, it's 3.5. So this bond is relatively polar. However, the carbon-sulfur bond is nonpolar. Both carbon and sulfur has an electronegativity value that is very close to each other, about 2.5. So we won't draw an arrow for that. So for this molecule, there's only one dipole moment. And so therefore, it's polar. So our last example will be BH2F. So boron has an electronegativity value of about 2.0. And hydrogen is slightly more electronegative than it. It's about 2.1. So the arrow points towards hydrogen, but it's very, very small. However, the boron-fluorine bond is very, very polar. We know fluorine has an EN value of 4.0. So this bond is almost ionic. Well, we can virtually say it's ionic for the most part. So if we draw the arrow, this arrow should be about 20 times greater than this size, or than that arrow. So we get something that looks like this. So basically, these dipole moments are insignificant compared to this one. So this molecule is relatively polar. Generally speaking, not always, but generally, whenever the outer elements are different, you're safe. it's safe to assume that it's polar. 95% of the time, it's going to be polar. If all of the outer elements are identical and there's no lone pairs on the center atom, then you're going to have a a nonpolar molecule if all of the outer elements are identical. Now, if they're identical, but let's say if you do have a lone pair, 90% of the time it's going to be polar if those lone pairs aren't symmetrical with respect to each other. So let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. So one example that we've considered is IF3. This molecule is polar. You have lone pairs on one side, pretty much the top side, but not on the bottom. However, here's another example of a molecule that's nonpolar. Xenon tetrafluoride. It has two lone pairs, but these lone pairs are opposite to each other, and so they cancel out. So because this molecule is completely symmetrical, this would be nonpolar. So not every time you have a lone pair uh, will it make the molecule polar. Look for symmetry. If the lone pairs are like opposite to each other, for the most part, it's nonpolar. But if they're on one side and not the other side, typically you have a polar molecule. So that's